This BVTV web show is bringing you the next best thing to your own crystal ball, thanks to my renowned guest. She is the preeminent global expert on the subject of pre-adaptation. Her career spans four decades of working with founders, executives, and leading venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. My guest brings a unique perspective to the everyday challenges of work and life. She is American social biologist and futurist. Welcome, Rebecca Costa. Nice to see you, Malcolm. This Rebecca Costa BBTV web show is in three parts, and I'm sure you will want to watch all three parts over and over again as you absorb the fascinating futuristic insights and action ideas that Rebecca brings you. In part three, she will look at the seemingly unending problems we all face today in business. In part two, she reveals her thoughts on what she calls pre-adaptation, adapting before the fact. But we start with the part about Rebecca's work as a futurist and what she is seeing now. Welcome, Rebecca Costa. It's all yours. Lovely to see you, Malcolm. Tell me about what your, your work about as a futurist. How do you do it? Well, I don't talk to dead people. <laughs> I don't <laughs> rely on tarot cards or crystal balls. Uh, I think the term futurist, you know, kind of conjures up some images of, of uh, less than a scientist. Um, I'm a scientist by training, as you know. And uh, frankly, uh, if you have a million data points or a billion data points, it isn't that difficult to predict what a million and one is going to likely to be. Um, and so to a certain extent, what I do is I, in, I am involved in uh, predictive analytics uh, and use mathematics and trends to be able to predict what future outcomes might be. And those outcomes might be next week, uh, end of year, five years, 20 years, 50 years from now. Um, as you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, predictions about vaccines right now, you know, and, mm. and so you, we can look at historical data, which sometimes is relevant. And sometimes with an unusual pandemic and a new disease, not very relevant at all. Where, you know, it, there are times where historical data is very, very important and times where something new has, has occurred and real-time data is the only thing that you can respond to. And, mm. and so uh, as a futurist, you really have to uh, give different forms of data and different times of data and quality of data, uh, different weights. And mm. apparently I've done that right. <laughs> so do, just, just ask, let me ask a, um, a, a question there that, that a cynic may say, how many times have you been right or wrong? Or do you not go that way? Well, well, I don't really judge myself on a scorecard. You know, right. I, yeah, I, yeah, I quite agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, be, because I, I, I believe that any predictions that are that precise are more likely to be wrong than right. Um, and, and my reason for that is because in a complex environment, and, and my definition of complexity is very simple, there are more wrong options than there are right ones. And the number of wrong options are exponentially growing. So your odds of being precisely right are not very good, but you're right, but your odds of being generally correct about a direction or a trend that things are likely to go in uh, tend to be a little bit better in terms of odds. So most of my predictions tend to be uh, general. Um, I will say that this is not unusual. Predictive analytics has been growing in strength, uh, obviously because we keep adding more and more data and so mm. with data, we, our, our accuracies increase. So we have to remember that, you know, going back several decades ago, um, there was a Nordic com company that started taking um, uh, public data, no private data at all, just public data that was available on the internet. And they were able to ac accurately predict uh, the Arab Spring wow. uh, a full two years before it occurred. And they were within months in their prediction. So we have to understand that, that most of this data is not a, 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 a situation of invasion of privacy. Most of it is just out there on the internet. And we have so much data that our predictions are getting, um, I think, rather important and rather accurate, even though I say general, you know, general trends are really what I look at. Well, how can I ask then, how can the work that you do be a force for good for the future. 
Well, you know, we're all going through a global pandemic and it's mm. not as though we have not had many red flags along the way with the SARS virus and the, and the, the avian flu, the, uh, you know, with AIDS. I mean, we have to remember in 1984 when AIDS was just exploding all over the place, we didn't really know what we were dealing with. We, we were thinking, I mean, I'm old enough to remember that, that people thought if a mosquito bit somebody with AIDS and bit someone else that they would get it. Yeah. Um, this is how naive we were. And, and there was a great deal of fear in the world. And at that time, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services of the United States said, we're going to go all out and make a vaccine. We've got all the drug companies working on it. Is this sounding familiar? No. Yeah, yeah. I've got <laughs> all it. the drug companies all over the world, all the great scientists are going to work on a vaccine. Well, what is that? 36 years later, yeah, yeah. you don't have a vaccine for AIDS. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, we're, we're not good at that in medicine. What we're good at, you know, from a historical perspective, and again, everything I'm saying is factual, mm. but that's what's important. From a historical perspective, what we're good at is keeping you from dying from things. Yep, we're not yep. good at keeping you from getting things. In fact, the uh, historical evidence for vaccines is, is very dismal. We've only eliminated one disease from the, the, the face of the earth in the entire time we've had vaccinations and understood that part of the immune system. And that's smallpox. Every other disease exists somewhere in the world and waiting to rear its ugly head. So uh, mm. y y we have to look at the data and the data informs us, even though we have new technologies, the likelihood of having a vaccine that would get all the lineages, by the way, this, is, this, vac this uh, particular pandemic is, is, um, uh, happens to be uh, mutating very, very quickly into stronger versions. So the idea that we're gonna have a vaccine that's going to be really, really effective is not, not very good. Uh, no, no, not, not yeah, feasible. But, but, but we're gonna get to a point where you don't have to die from it. Yeah, that's the, yeah. that's the real positive message. I mean, there is a positive message in there. When you get to a point where you may get a disease, you call up your doctor, go see him. He gives you a five minute test. He says, yeah, you've got it. Here's a prescription. Go to the drugstore. Take this. You're going to feel crappy for two days, at, but you won't die from it. You'll be fine. And then you'll be immunized for X period of time, which we still don't know. But we but there's a good likelihood. It's a few years at least. Um then, you know, then it, do you care if there's a vaccine if you can't die from it? I think what's made this pandemic it's such a disruptor in, in business and our way of life is because the threat of death, you know, but, but if we can back off of that, which is what we're really, really good at and we have a history of doing um, and the therapeutics are working and fewer and fewer people are dying because we're making great strides in terms of our knowledge of how to keep people alive. Mm. Do you think, though, um, sometimes these things like the pandemic come along and then climate hits you, recession hits you, and suddenly the, the whole thing becomes a lot bigger than it really is? Well, you're talking about the intersection of multiple factors, right, mm. which, uh, which you have plenty of warning for. I mean, we know about climate change, right? We have empirical evidence. We have billions and billions of of measurements of the Earth's uh, surface temperature. We know what directions it's going in, but we would rather debate whether humans are responsible or not. Uh, from my standpoint, who cares who's responsible? It's happening. Yes. Let's just deal, yeah. we'll deal with the reality of it. I, I really don't care about the blaming, you know. Hmm. Uh, it could be a natural cycle. We could be contributing 5%, no percent, 100%. Uh, really, you know, we'll be arguing, you know, what is that? The, we're, we'll be arranging the, the chairs on the Titanic as we all go down. So, you know, there's really no point in that. Again, I'm, I'm a very practical scientist. I, I look at the data and say, if the data says this, it doesn't matter how you feel about things. We don't, we should not make decisions about how we feel about things, we should make decisions based on what is the data indicating the probability is. And if the probability is high, then it is, you know, nature has designed us to act in our self-interest, mm -hmm. right? So there is no greater advantage in business or in life than foresight, than the ability to do experiments about what is likely to occur, whether you have the same data that I have or not, you can logically extrapolate what is going to happen 
And if you think you're going to turn on a dime, that's like trying to turn an ocean liner. You've got to start your turn far earlier than ever before, or you're not likely to survive these disruptions. So what and are you is, saying? Are you that saying that people don't, uh, they don't, they don't make that turn early enough? No, you, you're not a speedboat. You're, you're not yeah. going to make that turn at, precisely at the moment this disruption occurs. Yeah. You know, you have a choice. I used to tell my friend that I had a friend that was chronically late every time we'd get together for lunch or dinner. And so one day I said to him, are, are you expecting to walk in just as the hand hits 12? You know, your foot is going to hit the restaurant entrance. I said, you know, what is the likelihood? So, so you're not making a decision to be on time. You're either making a decision to be late or early. Mm -hmm. So why don't we decide it's early? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Well, you're I know, I know lots. Lot. Precisely. You're not going to call a stock on the, the day it hits the highest point. You already yeah. know, we already know that in complex environments, you're not going to call it exactly when. So your choice is early, adapt yeah. early, or become a victim. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend like that, but if it was an 11 o'clock meeting, I would tell him it was half 10. <laughs> well, you were predapting. See, you were predapting to an environmental condition that you could extrapolate and see what was coming. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, then, I, me, then, I, I have infinite faith that humans can change. And I go, look, choose between early or late, but you're not going to come in as the, as the, uh, the hand hits 12. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I do remember, though, many years ago when I was in the travel and holiday business, we would overbook a plane because we had, um, uh, on average, the data showed us that 9% of people wouldn't show. That means that 9% of the plane would be empty, um, you know, which is not the way to do things. So we'd overbook by nine. That year, everybody turned up. <laughs> well, yes, but if you take... You know, just from a financial standpoint, if you take all the years that you were able to, to, you know, fill the seats properly versus the one year, which was an aberration where everybody mm. showed up, you came out ahead. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. So, you know, look, the, these when you're pre-dapting, it's not perfect. No. If you're striving for perfect, I'm not your gal. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I can strive for optimal. That yep. should always be the goal. What is the optimal over a period of time, hmm. right? And yeah. so you can argue what is optimal and what is that, what should that period of time be? Yeah. But if you're going to zero in on the one year that everybody showed up and say, all right, let's throw the whole bag, the whole system. I think, you know, you, you got nowhere to go. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, these these days, our blame culture does does that. It zooms in on that one day. Tell me, how are businesses, how do organizations use your services? Well, I'm a public speaker, so it, most people find me through conferences. I, I do not go out and actively promote any consulting. Um, we're under NDA with probably the largest global corporations in the world. I have a, a group of researchers who are in universities. They're uh, tracking where venture capital money is going. They're monitoring new patents that are filed all around the world so that we're able to inform companies in advance of what's coming, of what's breaking in terms of science, of where the money is going in terms of investment, because that's a sign that that trend is likely to break and about what time. So they're using us, most global corporations are using us as, as almost... Um, what should I say, as, as, uh, as, as seers to go out ahead and bring back the information, you know, just like the military does. And, yeah. and they, yeah. have, they have scouts. Yeah. They send out ahead to bring back the data. And in many ways, we're technology and science scouts for them. And, and so that is how they find me. They find me on the internet or through some other person that we've worked with. And then uh, we wound up uh, taking the, their board and their senior executives and hosting in-house in meetings for them to do imaginings. What, what is our position as this breaks? Uh, what is our position on robotics, facial recognition? 
right? Um, privacy software. You know, we're, we're looking at every aspect of scientific innovation and technology and preparing for it where we need to be ready for those disruptions. Mm. Rebecca, thanks for that. Well, let's move into part two. So much to think about and so stimulating. I like your concept of pre-adaptation as I think too many business leaders act after something's happened. In many cases, they could have clearly seen something was going to happen. So take us through your thinking, which was the subject of your top selling book, on the verge and what leaders should be doing about fast adaptation. Over well, to you. it's interesting you mentioned fast adaptation. I was considered the global expert on fast adaptation up until five years ago, after which I said, fast adaptation doesn't work anymore. We need pre-adaptation mm. because I don't have any more tools to help you go faster. But what I do have tools is I can help you get out ahead of change. And it's those that get out ahead of change that have a chance of surviving, but not only surviving, getting the jump on opportunity. And isn't that what leaders should be doing? You know, those that are buried in operational problems really need to lift their head up and look out toward the future because what a, few, what, a, what a leader needs to do is to prepare their organization for what is coming. And, 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 and in many ways, we become victims of our own success. When things are going really well, we say, well, don't fix something that's not broken. And when they're re- going really badly, we're under fire. Mm. So there really is no time for a CEO. There's no condition for a CEO to engage in foresight. And yet that is the most important quality of leadership as change, the rate of change and the severity of the change begins to accelerate. So we have to create a space for that in our businesses. So many people say, well, you know, what are the principles of pre-adaptation? And I cover all those in the book and there's 12 of them. We won't have a chance to go through all of them, but let's just zero in on one. One of them is any drive towards singularity is a drive toward extinction. So the best way to look at a complex environment is to look at how you invest in stocks or bonds or whatever in Wall Street, how you invest your financial portfolio. It is very unlikely you took all of your assets and invested it on one stock. Yeah, that would be stupid. Yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe you'll get lucky, but the odds are not good, right? So what do your financial advisors tell you to do in a complex, fast moving environment like that? They tell you to diversify. So if you're a business that has one service and you perform it one way, or you have one product for one market, you're very vulnerable. You're a very vulnerable company because you know if you're not disrupting, someone's gonna disrupt for you. And you're not, and you're gonna be out of business. So the most important principle is that any drive towards singularity, toward a single solution, a single product, a single service, a single market, a single way of doing business or thinking, you know, uh, is, is highly problematic. You must diversify. You must force your company to diversify. And the broader that diversification is, the better off you will be. You have a more likelihood of surviving disruption and being able to conduct business through that disruption. Mm. So where does the pre-adaptation thinking come in there um, to avoid that singular approach? Well, it's interesting, you know, companies want to solve problems one way. And so, you know, when they, when they encounter a problem, there's, there's sort of a big power grab and discussion about whose way is the best. And, and I argue uh, that in a complex environment where there are more wrong solutions than right ones, uh, whatever you pick is more likely to be wrong than right. So you really need to adapt a venture capitalist approach. Venture capitalists will go into something like 3D printing and they'll invest in 20, 30, 50 companies. And what they do is they, they know that despite all their due diligence, and they're some of the best an, uh, analysts in the world, they're not going to call the right company. No. So what they do is they give a first round of funding, like a funnel, and, and then the second round of funding, very few get that. 
You have to hit certain milestones. And then they look again and the third round of funding even fewer, but they know that at the bottom of the funnel, one or two who lead the pack are gonna come out and they're gonna place a bigger bet on that. So I would say that when you have a group of solutions, the wrong thing to do is instead of a funnel, insist on a tube. Your likelihood of that solution being correct is not good. And by the way, it's the same financial investment, right? Instead of investing in one solution, which is more likely to be wrong than right, invest in many and develop within your company a failure tolerant mentality. We want lots of failures at the beginning, fewer in the second round of funding, fewer still in the third round of funding, but we're going to fund multiple pathways to solve the problem and or mm. meet the demand. Mm. In, in our simple way here at BizVision, we've done exactly that. We've launched a whole series of different channels um, and we've filtered them down. And, you know, as they've been picked up or not picked up, and we'll continue to filter. Uh, it's quite demanding, but it's much more safe. It's, it's a guarantee. It's a guarantee that you will wind up with something that works. You know, the current coronavirus is a, is a good example. If you look at all the things we did at the beginning, because we had no knowledge, mm. this was coming at us at real time. So we were building ventilators, we were arguing about masks and we were investing in vaccines and we were shutting down uh, the economy and, and we were doing all these different things at one time. And guess what? As time went on, we said, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, this, some of these therapies, they're really not working very well. Let's kill those. Let's put more time into remdesivir, right? Mm, let's yeah. put more money. Let's put more money into this type of vaccine and, and get rid of these others that we know. So as you're collecting real-time data, you're really narrowing down to the solutions that do work. But you have to be tolerant of failure. Pre Predaptation requires failure. You know, it requires you to take on much more than you're going to see to fruition. And that's mm -hmm. a real shift in the mentality that most CEOs have. Most CEOs want to pick the right direction. They feel that that is what leadership should do. Leadership should have the wisdom and experience and knowledge to pick the right solution and then direct all the company resources toward that solution. And that's just not the world we live in right now. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of brings me to the thinking that the difference between America and the UK, in the UK, if you fail, you know, you're, you're failed forever. Um, whereas in the America, if you fail, pick yourself and, and get on with it again. We, um, well, we have a culture. I work, with, that... I work with a lot of global companies and I have to tell you that, that what happens over time is this, this, uh, this, lack of tolerance for failure becomes institutionalized. Mm. But, but remember this, it's a self-imposed constraint, right? And the wonderful thing about anything that's self-imposed, it can be self-unimposed. You yes. know, you, yeah. you cannot, you know, according to Edgar Schein, who used to run MIT's uh, uh, business uh, school, their Sloan Business School, um, your corporate culture comes from the founders of the corporation. So if you're a Sam Walton, you know, Walmart or, or Steve Jobs, Apple computer, the, the originator of the company forges the culture. So you can't really change corporate culture, but you can evolve it. And the way that Edgar Schein talks about it is, is that he says that in order to evolve a culture, you need only ask one question. And that question is, what is it about our culture that's getting in the way? Yes, I what love is, that. What is it about our culture that is getting in the way of innovation, that is getting in the way of financial success? And Edgar Schein makes the point that if you remove that obstacle, the culture will change with it. So he makes the point that don't go, don't bother wasting your money hiring these consultants that say, we will change your culture. He said, what a big fat waste of time and money. 
He said, deal with the practicalities that there's something getting in the way of you succeeding. And when you remove that, the culture will come with it. Mm. And, and I suppose that sort of thing as well um, still re- protects and respects the heritage of the business. It's not. You can't, you can't change it. that. You know, yeah. I mean, you, you, you really can't. It will evolve over time. Time mm. will require for it to evolve. Yeah. But but the the origins of culture really do come from the founders, mm. you know. And I've had the pleasure of working with Steve Jobs at Apple Computer and Larry Ellison at you know at Oracle, oh, and yeah. you know I, I I I've I've worked with the giants in Silicon Valley, and I can tell you their personality is imprinted on that organization. Uh, but that doesn't mean the organization isn't evolving and changing. Mm. Yeah. Just before we move to part three, can you just tell my viewers and listeners what they will gain by buying On The Verge? Well, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training who right after college landed in what later became Silicon Valley. So I became swept away by technology and science, and I couldn't have landed in a better place in the 19th, the late 70s and the early 80s. It was the place to be. Um, And I'm so sorry my children couldn't experience that because we were sleeping at our desks. We didn't even want to go home. We were changing the world. And and when you think about it, we succeeded. We did change the world. Now, there could be an argument for better or for worse. You know, my kids are on social media all day long and I'm thinking, ah, yeah, yeah, what have I done? You know, um, but, but I think that what I do is I draw from the greatest and longest running empirical example we have, which is mother nature herself. Mm. And to date, 99.99999% of the species on the planet are extinct. There's a very, very small percentage, mostly insects, by the way, that have survived. And so I became very fascinated by what were the rules that these, that these survivors followed that allowed them to adapt to tremendous changes in environmental circumstances. And so that's what I have done. I have taken those lessons that we can learn from a really high probability of failure, those lessons we can learn and then transpose them over to business and said, if you follow these rules, the likelihood is you will be out ahead of change and you will survive disruption. Brilliant. Not only will you survive disruption, you'll probably be the, the company that's making it. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, get on the verge. Let's move to part three. I trust, viewers, your brain is whirring away like mine. I, I tell you, I'm a bit confused. I'm not following the proper process of our recording here because I'm getting so much into what Rebecca's telling me about. I told you, you'll want to watch this web show a few times and discuss with colleagues. Now, let's continue your thinking as Rebecca delves into handling that seemingly case sera sera situation of never ending problems we all face. She revealed what can be done in her other best-selling book, The Watchman's Rattle. I'm intrigued about the book title, Never mind the content. So Rebecca, tell us about that book title and what's inside. Uh, the earliest police forces did not carry arms. They, they, they were volunteers in the neighborhood that patrolled the neighborhood late at night looking for burglars or, or other uh, problems, perhaps uh, being attacked by enemies. And uh, instead of uh, any arms or this idea that they were going to defend the neighborhood as a sole watchman, uh, all throughout the world, they carried these rattles. And the rattles were made out of different things. Uh, In in China, they were a series of balls that later became weapons. Uh, In in, uh, Western Europe, they were made out of wood and and they would go clack, 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 and they would make a very, very loud noise. And they were summons for help. And all the neighbors would wake up and then they would defend their their neighborhood or catch the burglar or whatever. And I and and I really wrote this book uh, a number of years ago as a summons, as a calling for help. I made a discovery. It's the only major discovery that I've made. (laughs) Um, And I thought it was an important one. And I took it to a number of scientists and said, I want to be sure that I have this right. 
It's that all societies and all organizations go through several uh, stages before they collapse. And I identified what those three stages were. The first is complexity, the complexity of day-to-day -day operations or organization becomes unmanageable. Too much for our simple brains, which are rather prehistoric to even comprehend. Even with computer help, we can't get our arms around the facts. The second stage is that we become massively confused between what is an empirical fact and what's an unproven belief. We can't tell. So in the early stages of development, whether it's a company or whether it's a society, these two things coexist. Where knowledge drops off, we just substitute beliefs. Beliefs are very cognitively easy. I believe it or I don't believe it. Mm. To prove something is a whole nother category of cognitive exercise. So what happens is complexity accelerates. It starts moving faster and faster. More laws, uh, more difficulty understanding where our water or energy comes from, uh, more layers of, of bureaucracy. Then we can't tell an empirical fact from an unproven belief. The third stage is that public policy or corporate policy begins to be forged based on unproven beliefs and not empirical facts. And once those three stages are met, we're now vulnerable for cataclysmic collapse because we're no longer operating on facts, but on beliefs and opinions and charismatic leaders. And this becomes very, very problematic. So I wasn't very interested in whatever the uh, triggering event was, because I think historians have covered that, of the, uh, of the Mayan collapse, the Roman collapse. There are historians that did a better job at that than I would ever do. But I was interested in if there was a way that societies and leadership were acting that made them vulnerable to that triggering event. And so I did go back in the Watchman's Rattle to the Ming society, the Egyptian society, the Mayans, the Khmer, the Romans, and in each case, it followed these stages prior to the triggering event. Wow. Wow, that is very revealing, isn't it? Well, yeah. you know, many people write to me from all over the world and say, well, what stage are we in right now? And I said, well, I leave that up to you to judge. Yeah. You know, have we moved past being able to dissect what is an empirical fact? What is an, an unproven belief? I believe we have. Is public policy now being forged on unproven beliefs? We may be in that stage. If that is the case, we can expect a very, very radical correction to happen across the globe. When I say collapse, I don't mean everyone will die. No. I simply mean that systems will revert to a level that the human brain can comprehend. So instead of credit default swaps on Wall Street, which nobody can explain to me, and I'm a pretty smart person, but I still don't understand how they work. Um, instead of sitting in front of my financial advisor who talks what looks like it's English, proper English, I, I don't understand what he's saying, you know, I should do. Um, it's just too complicated for me. So instead of that, what our brains are designed to do by nature is understand barter. You have some carrots, I have some potatoes, we meet in the road, we both bicker till we think we got the better deal, we make the trade and we leave. This is what the human brain is evolved to be able to understand. As we get further and further and further away from that, and you try to understand, you know, how is currency valued of, of a company? You know, you try to understand these things, they don't make any sense anymore. And so when they begin to not make sense, we know we're in for correction and we have to go back to a level of operating that makes sense. And then we make the climb again. Mm. Rebecca, it's been mind stimulating meeting you. I can just imagine uh, sitting by the fire, having a glass of wine. Well, how many bottles will go through just listening to you? But you're not finished yet. There may be a lot of viewers at the moment are having a lot of uncertainty about achieving what you propose, seeing the future, overcoming challenges. So just before you leave us, 
please give those self-doubters a final three pieces of call to action advice. What should they do now? Well, the first thing is, is to not deny yourself the greatest asset that humans have ever evolved. What separates us from the lower animals is our ability to do thought experiments about the future, to do imaginings, and, and then to fashion some action in the present to avoid a negative outcome, or even more importantly, to get the jump on opportunity. So know that you have this wonderful asset that you have evolved over many millions of years and use it because it would be very unnatural as a species to not use the greatest assets you have for survival. So that would be one thing. The second thing is buy the books. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? I hate, I, I hate to say that, but obviously in an interview like this, I can't cover as much as I want to. Yeah. Uh, my father, I, this is a little side story, but my father had told me once, he said, do you ever notice people are moving away from you at cocktail parties? I'm going to give you a little tip. You know, I know that you know a lot. You're very smart. and I'm very proud of you. He said, but in order to make friends, what I want you to do the next time you go to a party is I want you to walk up and say, how about that game? <laughs> right. And I said, what game? And he said, doesn't matter. Everyone will start talking. You'll be <laughs> part of the group immediately. So, so I, I understand it can be overwhelming. Fortunately, in the book, there's a narrative. And I give many humorous examples, like my father and so on and so forth, that, that, that help the book to be very readable and very easy. It's not, it's not a science textbook. So, so I would encourage that. The third thing is to look for people who speak the truth to you, who, who have no stake in giving you the truth. The highest compliment I have ever received was from the, uh, the head of global research and development for Abbott Laboratories. And he said to me, sometimes I feel very uncomfortable by the things you say, but I never, underappreciate your intellectual honesty. So look for people that are intellectually honest and going to give you the truth about your company, about the culture, about what's, what lies ahead, and then lean fearlessly into that truth. Mm, I like that because too many people give you information or uh, act one things on their own agenda, but given the truth, that's different, isn't it? In, in this is. extra, we is, have to value that. We have to value the truth. Yeah. We, we, we must not politicize it. No. In this extra special BVTV web show, I've been talking to American sociobiologist and futurist Rebecca D. Costa. Rebecca, thanks for getting everyone inspired and thinking. Well, thank you, Malcolm, and thank you for the good work you're doing.